Hello and welcome back to Bookish. This is an unusual video. I'm shooting a response video on Sunday. I'm gonna go, gonna go ahead and put it up. If you follow my channel, you know I usually only post videos on Saturday, Tuesday, uh, and Thursday, but this was a topic that really I, I was really interested in, and so I thought I'd go ahead and make a video. And the topic uh, came up uh, from a video that uh, Mark from Book Time with Elvis did, in which the title of his video was Kids Can't Read, Won't Read. Um, and I watched that video and I thought it was really interesting and as an educator, since Mark is an educator, I always am interested to hear what he has to say about education and reading and you know we're all readers. Sean D. Stanfast then made uh, a video uh, about uh, the same topic and then I saw Working Man Reads uh, made a video uh, about this. Jay Shea made a video which is not exactly about this same topic but was inspired by another video that Mark made uh, and he touched on something that I kind of want to uh, make sure that I uh, talk about today too. So I'll leave links to all those uh, channels and videos uh, down below. But this topic of you know why kids or kids can't read, kids won't read, is one of those things which always kind of gets my attention. It has a tendency to kind of get my ire up uh, as a parent uh, who now has adult kids um, and as a former teacher myself. Anything that has to do with kids and education always like, really gets my attention. So I was really interested in what Mark had to say and really interested in the source uh, that led to Mark's video. And the source that led to Mark's video was an article in The Guardian essentially talking about this topic. Uh, citing a survey uh, that just took place in Great Britain. So, you know, I'm an American, but just took place in Great Britain uh, about kids and reading and access to books. And the thrust of that article seemed to be that parents have stopped buying their kids books because they're too expensive and because the times are hard. Now, Sean, in his video, kind of made a point of saying there's probably something political about that article. It's, it's kind of like a veiled criticism of the current uh, conservative government, and, and that's fair enough. But that's the thrust of the article, I think, that, that parents think books, books are expensive and therefore parents are not buying as many books for kids, so kids don't have access to books, so kids, the literacy of children is in danger because they're not reading at home. That's kind of the, the basic outline of this. Um, and one of the things that, the, uh, that, the, that Mark, Sean, and Working Men Reads all came to the conclusion was that this is, of course, the parents' fault. It's the parents' fault that kids aren't reading. And the survey does primarily focus on, I think, on um, survey information of kids five to eight. So the simple truth of the matter is, almost anything involving kids five to eight is the parents' fault or is something the parents are doing right. Because between five and eight, you don't have disposable income. You don't have freedom of movement. You can't go over do whatever you want to. And you pretty much have to do what other people tell you. Um, and so, in a sense, yes, I buy into the idea uh, that this uh, reading crisis that the article uh, in The Guardian points out is, uh, has to be laid at the feet of the parents because it can't be laid at anybody else's feet. But there are a couple of things about that article and about statistics in that article that I just want to kind of point out uh, because the article like, obviously takes this kind of grim view uh, of the future and we're facing this literacy apocalypse. Uh, because of this, you know, downturn in kids having access to books at their home. But if you read the article closely and you look at the statistics in both in in the opposite way in which the article looks at them, I think you get a slightly different picture. First of all, for all the doom and gloom of the article, it kind of mentions that this whole access to books thing <clears throat> and kids reading thing, you know, statistic is really just one point <clears throat> six percent higher than it was in 2019. So I'm not sure how much of a crisis that is, and given you know COVID and lockdown restrictions and people's you know inability to go out and maybe go to libraries and their inability to go out or unwillingness to go out and buy books and you know all those kind of things, this doesn't seem that shocking to me that there was a 1.6 percent or whatever increase. As a matter of fact, it's a little shocking to me that that's the only uh, that that's how small the increase were. But there are other kind of really specific uh, stats in there that I, I wanted to kind of highlight. So one of the stats they highlight in the article and then is highlighted in the videos is it says that 18.6% of UK kids say they don't have access to books at home. Okay, so 18.6% of UK kids say they don't have access to books at home. So if we just take that statistic, statistic and turn it the other way, that means 81.4% of UK kids, the vast majority of UK kids, do have access to books at home. That's a 
fairly high number of people who have access to books at home. Also, the, and I didn't go further, and maybe the survey does, but the article doesn't make it clear you know, exactly how they defined book. Are they defining book as a physical book? Or are they defining book as ebooks? Uh, or uh, are they defining having access to books as going to the library? It doesn't really say. You know, one of the things that that uh, Mark and Sean working in reads kind of emphasize is that even if you're poor, you can go to the library. Well, I'm not sure the survey do survey doesn't indicate. I'm not sure the survey indicates that people aren't taking their kids to the library for exactly those purposes. And I'm not sure the survey indicates that people don't have and their kids aren't giving being given access to ebooks. Okay, so I'm because they don't really define book in the article, as far as I could tell my, from my reading, then I'm not exactly sure that the number of kids who have access to books wouldn't be lower. And I'll also just point out that during the school year, certainly kids do have access to books at school. So the whole idea that literacy is failing because kids don't have a book at home is somewhat mitigated. I mean, when the kids answer the question, do you have access to books at school, books at home, were they including books that they could <clears throat> check out from the school library or books that their teacher uh, would let them take to give them uh, to bring home? You know, that that's a fairly significant difference. And I'm not sure that question's answered. The other thing I'll point out is that 18.6% <clears throat> of, of kids say they don't have access to books at home. The poverty rate or the poverty level in the UK is 16%. So the number of kids uh, who, you know, don't have access to books, who don't live in poverty is, again, relatively small. And I'll come back to this poverty thing in a minute. But certainly we are all aware, I think, that people who live in poverty have less access to other things. And lots of the people who made these other videos point out, well, these people have phones, they pay for, you know, a data plan, they pay for phones for themselves and their kids. You know, let me just point out, uh, in the world we live in today, having a phone like that, for an adult at least, and oftentimes for a kid, is a necessity in lots of places, particularly places like the UK, uh, that that phone is actually a necessity. And I'm not sure we can just classify it as something that is a luxury item. You know, maybe we can, maybe we can, but I think we need to be careful about that. The other thing I also I oftentimes... Uh, one of the things that, that it, I don't know if you picked up on this or not, but I have a hard time with people telling other people how they should be spending their money. Um, so, you know, to suggest that it's poor families paying for, poor parents paying for phones instead of buying books, that that's the problem, I think kind of jumps ahead a few steps on what we're talking about here. But certainly people who live in poverty are, we know, are li less likely to buy books, less likely to have books in their homes. Hell, they're less likely to have homes. Uh, but I'll get back to this in just a minute uh, later. Another st stat in the book, it says one in 13 kids who they surveyed said they never read. So let's just take into account that sometimes kids don't give the right answer. But one out of 13 kids said, surveyed say they don't read. Even if we take that at face value, that means that only 7% of the kids surveyed in the UK, 7% say they never read. That means that 93% of the kids in the UK who answered the survey said that they read sometimes. You know, that 7%, as sad as that may be, and here in booktube world, you know, that seems like a tragedy. And in lots of ways it is. Has it ever not been around that level? I mean, have we really like had a time where 100% of kids read, uh, you know, uh, where 100 percent of kids would say that they all that they read and that no kids would say they never read I, I find that hard to believe and I have to be honest with you you tell me 93 percent of kids surveyed said that they read sometime I'm thinking well that sounds pretty good to me so notice that if you just take the statistic and turn it the other way then I don't think it's quite as dire as people make it out to be the other statistic I want to highlight is that in the survey they said that 51 percent of adults surveyed said that books were too expensive Books are too expensive. They are. Books cost a lot of money. Uh, physical books are expensive. I feel that way, and I buy books all the time. I think that they're expensive. <clears throat> also notice, though, 51% of, of UK adults said books were too expensive, but, you know, more than 80% of UK adults provide access to books to their kids in their home. 
So we have a lot of adults who think books are too expensive who are still providing their kids with access to books in the home. So this idea that, you know, that, which I said was kind of to me the thrust of the article, that people, that kids are not getting access to books at their home because adults think the books are too expensive and therefore adults are not providing kids with books, that doesn't really seem to be borne out by the statistics. That means a lot of people out there who think books are too expensive are still buying books uh, in the UK, are giving their kids access to books in the UK. Uh, and so I think that's kind of an important thing uh, to keep in mind. And then I want to get to kind of Jay Shea's point and this, this whole idea about, you know, it being the parent's fault, which it certainly is. If kids between five and eight don't have access to books, it's the parent's fault. But when we use that word fault, we are essentially blaming and we are saying that they are doing something wrong. And I'm not one of those people who's, not, who's going to tell you that none of these people are doing something wrong. You know, obviously, people of all socioeconomic groups do things that are wrong. But for people living in poverty, I think it's important to look at something Jay talked about, and that's the time cost of reading. You know, there is the uh, economic cost, or I should say the, the monetary cost, or the physical cost of reading. There's also the time cost of reading. So let's think about... The, that family, that parent, single parent, dual parent family, whatever, that family uh, that lives in poverty. They're among that 16% who, who live in poverty. And keep in mind, we're also kind of jumping ahead and saying that it's the poor parents who aren't providing their kids access with books. And we're saying that because as a general rule, we, we understand how economics works. But let's look at that, that family, okay? And think about the time they have to emphasize reading with their kids. So, Let's assume, people, let's assume we divide the day into thirds. There's the reading part, of, there's the sleeping part of the day, there is the work school part of the day, and then there's the part of the day when you're not at work or school. Let's divide that into eight hours. So eight hours of sleep. Can you read with your kids during while they're asleep? Let's just go with no. Eight hours of school, eight hours of work. Can you read with your kids when they're at school, when they're at work? That, the answer to that is just no. That leaves then eight hours uh, of time uh, potentially in which parents could be buying books if they could afford them and reading books with their kids or emphasizing the importance of reading books to their kids or reading as a model for their kids. A couple of things to keep in mind I think here. You know when we divide the day in these eight hour blocks I think a lot of us, particularly probably a lot of us here on BookTube, assume those eight hours all occur at the same time. That all members of the family sleep in the same eight hours, they go to work and school in the same hours, and then they're off work in the, in school the same eight hours. That's really not true. And as a matter of fact, if you live in poverty, the more likely it is that you do not have those share those same eight hours off. You know, a kid goes off to school in the morning, let's say a kid goes to school day at eight, and their parents' work shift begins at three. So right away, if that's true, then the eight hours the kids are at work really don't coincide or have much overlap with the eight hours the parents work. You know, and even if it's not that severe, you're still taking time away. So you're reducing the number of hours in which parents have to model reading, to read to their kids, is being reduced because, you know, parents who are working parents who live, uh, whose, you know, income doesn't lift them out of poverty, probably don't work that regular kind of eight to four, nine to five job. They don't get to have fixed hours. They work different points of time. In addition to that, they're much more likely to work on the weekends. You know, they don't necessarily have the weekends off. And so when their kids are not, you know, uh, at school, parents may be working part of that time as well. And so what you see here, I think, is that oftentimes that we assume that lots of parents have lots of time to read with their kids because, you know, we think about the work day, the work week and or the week being structured, the day being structured in a certain way, which really isn't true for lots of parents, particularly for lots of uh, of poor parents. You know, there are lots of parents who work the overnight shift and they're asleep when their kid, you know, uh, gets home from school. Okay? They work overnight, they do the things they have to do during the day, and then they sleep when their kids get home from school. This is a reality. And so I think, you know, to a certain extent, uh, one of the things I, I, I kind of picked up on the videos of other people was that there's no excuse for parents not reading their kids or parents not emphasizing reading their kids. And I really think that that overlooks a lot of things that are reality for lots of people. Now, does that mean that these people have no time in which they could model reading for kids and no time in which they can read for kids? No, but it also probably means that there may be other things that are uh, higher priorities in their mind than that. And that, in fact, may be a tragedy. In a sense, that's why we have schools to make up for 
uh, that difference, to provide that education, that reading opportunities to kids whose parents maybe can't, and even those parents who won't. Anyway, uh, there you go. There's my response to the uh, stream of videos that came out yesterday about kids can't read, won't read. Uh, just wanted to throw my two cents in there. I look forward to your comments in the comment section below, and as always, thank you for watching.